Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to another meeting of our New School for Social Research Summer Talk Series. I'm Zed Adams, Chair of the Philosophy Department here at the NSSR. Our talk series is called The Current Moment, Perspectives from the Social Sciences and Humanities. And I think it's important to begin by mentioning that a new dimension of the current moment has become salient over the past week as millions have turned out to protest the persistent and unchecked scourge of police violence against Black Americans. Both Jay Bernstein on Monday and Dominic Petman today have mentioned to me their worries that their talks are not about, or not explicitly about the current moment in that sense, um, insofar as they both were written before, before this week. And I share and appreciate their worry, but my hope is, is twofold. It's first, that we can use their talks as a jumping off point for discussing everything that is, that is going on right now. Um, so that's one hope. And that worked well on Monday and I, and I think it will work well today again. But a second hope is, uh, is that we're gonna line up an additional meeting of our talk series to talk explicitly about Black Lives Matter and the rise of, of tyranny in America. So stay tuned. I hope you'll, I hope we'll be able to line that up soon and announce it officially and you'll be able to join us for that. So all of that said, I need to welcome two people. First, my, my co-host in a sense is Miranda Young, a PhD student in the philosophy department here at the NSSR. She's going to help me uh, field and organize the, the questions for our, for our main, main event for our speaker today. Dominic Petman who's the University Professor of Culture and Media at the New School for Social Research. Uh, I'm very excited about Dominic's presentations because it's gonna take a, an interesting kind of creative form. His presentation is titled, Netflix and Chill on Digital Distraction in the Time of Quarantine. And it's gonna take the form of a short film that Dominic has put together for us. So he's gonna introduce that and then we're gonna watch it and it'll be about half an hour. And then after that half an hour, as in previous meetings, we're gonna have a nice bit of time for a Q&A with Dominic. And the form of that Q&A can either take, um, you can open up the Q&A box on Zoom and type in questions. You can start typing in questions during the film itself or during the Q&A, or you can also raise your hand in the participants section and we'll call on you to ask your question live uh, to us. So that's it. I uh, hope you'll join me all in welcoming Dominic. Thanks so much, Zed. Thanks, Miranda. Thanks, Kirill. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's, it's thanks all you folks out there that I can't see uh, for joining us in this distributed non-place of Zoomtopia. Um, I'm happy to be representing liberal studies, which I've chaired in the past and teach in um, these days. Uh, liberal studies is uh, uh, in, in interdisciplinary space where we discuss the history of ideas, critical theory, um, critical media theory, uh, what we're starting to call the new humanities or post-humanities, um, aesthetics and poetics, and with a, with a sort of emphasis on accessible but sophisticated writing and more and more some kind of multimedia aspects. So Indeed, how quickly the current moment can change, although I, I do, obviously there are, it doesn't just happen, um, does, we don't just flip a switch. So that is very, the seeds of what's happening right now are definitely in this talk, even if they're just under the surface. So we can, I look forward to talking about that after, after the film. And I should definitely thank my wife, Merit, who made, a, who made the film. Um, she adapted my piece, which was, published recently in uh, Boundary 2. Uh, Netflix and Chills actually said that Chills is key um, because this was all about the COVID um, moment, which is of course completely behind us. We don't have to worry about the virus anymore um, because the new cycle um, is not good at multitasking. So yeah, um, this piece really was a kind of attempt to write the disaster in, in Blanchot's uh, sense it's it's not really a hot take I guess it's a lukewarm take and rather than set it up too much I think I'll just 
show the film and then we can take it from there. So I hope it, um, hope it speaks to you one way or another. So bear with me as I do the, share the screen. My wife is in love with a bear, specifically a Russian bear who was rescued as an orphan cub three years ago near a rural airfield and who has since grown into what I must admit is the most handsome and charming creature. She watches him all day between all her various doings through a live cam as he slumbers, cavorts or daydreams. She has learned all his different moods, from pensive to mischievous, and she knows who are uh, his favorite and least favorite of the humans who arrive periodically to bring food and clean the enclosure. One thing I have gleaned from the raw footage I have seen is that this bear is incredibly intelligent and resourceful. Bored with his limited surroundings, he has still managed to create games for himself, pushing a large flat rock around the compound like a toy truck or twisting a log into a hammock so that it becomes something resembling a rowboat. He loves resistance from the world and is visibly smiling when life pushes back against him in surprising ways, whether in the form of a large tire hanging from a tree or his favorite of all the humans, Andre. If a bear plays in the forest, does anyone see him? In this case, yes. Even at 3 a.m., he might be swimming in his pool making intricate games with his giant paws and the physics of water. Other times, he becomes exhausted by the lack of existential pushback and lies on his giant furry paws, reflecting rather glumly on his plight, locked in a cage about half an acre square. At these times, a deep melancholy can descend on his large, charismatic head, the same head which swayed back and forth with such joy just the day before, while playing with a sapling and trying to turn it into his own private, flexible jungle gym. Even before COVID-19 hit New York hard, I felt there was something allegorical about this bear's life and the fact that we have access to it via new digital tools that simultaneously seem to open and close worlds. But now, as we move into the second month of stay-at-home orders and social distancing, it's impossible not to feel a strong kinship with this sensitive, trapped animal on the other side of the world. In some sense, we could not ask for a better quarantine coach or mentor in this bear, who, in an act of imaginative alchemy, manages to transform the base materials of a bleak Russian winter into a playground for his own fancy and delight. But the effort involved is clearly immense, and the come down can be hard. Between the self-fashioned entertainment lies long stretches of what Walter Benjamin called empty homogenous time, a form of temporal measurement that the philosopher felt was an illusion compared to the full textures of historical experience. And yet the boredom of individual experience can indeed feel hollow and monotonous. Quarantine time is strange and queasy. Some days go fast, while the weeks seem to take months. Each day bleeds into the next, like a punctured bottle of cough syrup sopped up by a bag of cotton wool. Apparently we did not fully appreciate the extent to which daily routines and social interaction structures and recalibrates our sense of duration. Although the incarcerated, the unemployed, the aged, the monastic, the scholastically entrapped, and the addicted understand this brute fact instinctively. What should we call that feeling when the general structure of feeling begins to lose its structure? Boredom was considered a threshold experience by Martin Heidegger, the controversial German philosopher. He believed it was shot through with potential to wake us up from the numbing comfort of our distractions and deliver us into a more authentic relationship with the vertiginous miracle of being. Modernity, for this same thinker, represented nothing more or less 
than the forgetting of being. Thanks to the inoculating efficiency of modern technologies, automatized habits, alienating impulses, and existential disavowals. Well, the sudden collapse of our social and economic system has jolted us out of this zombie-like days. The remembering of being, however, is no picnic. Especially for creatures who have dedicated at least the last few centuries to repressing the full force and feeling of its fragile and fleeting nature. We are thrown into this world without asking to be. So we must contend with being wrenched into existence out of the rather smug continuum of lifeless matter. Which is why Georges Bataille calls us discontinuous beings, forever attempting to simulate some kind of continuity, especially through erotic pseudo-fusions. The battle between soothing distraction from and painful acknowledgement of the conscious burden of being individuals, along with our own lonely trajectories and fates, is ongoing, however. Netflix is one of the most popular strategies we have against smashing our bug-like faces against the onrushing windscreen of personalized finitude. And as such, it embodies a new kind of digital cogito. I watch, therefore I am, not. Indeed, I'm beginning to suspect that Netflix itself has become sentient and is trying to communicate with us and perhaps even warn us against further dangers to come. Take, for instance, the new reality TV show The Circle. This franchise, which began in the UK but has since mushroomed into the US, Brazil and France, features contestants who isolate themselves in separate apartments in the same building, only able to communicate with each other via text. Essentially a cross between Big Brother, Survivor, and Black Mirror, the viewer enjoys a sense of voyeuristic access and omnipotence as the contestants talk to themselves, narrating their thoughts in a self-conscious, no doubt contractually obliged form of mental extrusion. Like the Russian bear on YouTube, they are mostly left to their own devices to keep themselves entertained, while food arrives periodically at their door. But in this case, they are competing for a cash prize by participating in a socially mediated popularity contest. Consider also Love is Blind, which also premiered on Netflix just a couple of weeks before the virus infected our media ecology as much as our bloodstreams. Here again, contestants were mostly relegated to isolated pods and obliged to talk to each other in highly mediated ways. Again, not even seeing each other's faces, but relying on the spoken or written word to make conversation, diversion, judgments. Was Netflix preparing us for an imminent world of radical separation and the simulation of company or community? Moreover, did the CEO of Netflix, along with Jeff Bezos, engineer COVID-19 in his evil lair? so that we would all be 100% reliant on their commercial vectors to eat and stay even vaguely entertained? Being a college professor suddenly obliged to move my classes online, I've had a lot of time to reflect on the experience of trying to simulate some sense of togetherness in real time. It's like we had a premonition when we named the next generation Zoomers, isn't it? The Zoom room may be a reasonable facsimile of a seminar, but it lacks the palpable textures, material, mental, emotional, that only sharing an intimate sphere carved from the analog curves of the space-time continuum can provide. Indeed, this is another thing we have lost, at least in the medium term. The synchronicity of co-presence, the potential to be bored together and then leap across this boredom into a kind of infectious intellectual epiphany. The seminar is a privileged space where we attune to each other's moods on various registers and navigate these effective landscapes with the aid of social graces and conceptual compasses. As a result, few things are as depressing as a bad class. Conversely, Few things are as exhilarating as a good one. 
Personally, I miss all those tiny, random, asymptotic encounters that inspired me to move to New York in the first place. This great city, already significantly hollowed out by neoliberal policies and the black mold of global capital, is now uncannily quiet, except for the sirens, which serve as a constant reminder that things are rapidly becoming medieval here in the Plagopolis. Suddenly, even the most rote, fatic, and alienated of daily exchanges seems utopian to me, or rather, Arcadian, lost, like the Garden of Eden. From out of my living room window, I can see the El Dorado, which along with the Dakota, the San Remo, and the Beresford, is one of the most expensive and exclusive apartment complexes in this part of the city. There are about 20 floors and at least 100 different dwellings. Judging by the lights, only one apartment is currently occupied. The rich have fled the city for their Hamptons retreats, Caribbean getaway, or New Zealand bunker. I say we don't let any of them back in. Due to my own now common paranoia about enclosed, potentially infected spaces, my apartment has suddenly become a nine-story walk-up. Good exercise, at least. Although I have been doing my part to flatten the curve by staying inside my one-bedroom apartment as much as possible, only scurrying to the park once or twice a week around dawn to remember what the outside world looks, feels, and smells like. The last time I went downtown was to retrieve some items I needed from my office after being told that all university buildings were being closed for an unspecified amount of time. This was only a few days after New York City officially went on pause, closing all restaurants, cafes, bars, and other inessential establishments. As long as my neurons hold out, I will not forget the epic, apocalyptic flavor of this walk. 70 blocks south and then back again, since I was not willing to risk the subway. It was like a cross between the Odyssey and I Am Legend. The streets were eerily deserted except for the occasional homeless person or stranded tourists wandering about dazed. I could stroll down 7th Avenue, no problem. Everything was shuttered. Even Times Square was empty except for an illegal gathering of 30 or so religious zealots, punctual as always, declaring the end of the world through a megaphone and the subsequent need to repent. One of these modern-day millenarians even had a crucifix over his shoulder that he was dragging along the pavement. The scene felt especially pathetic, as it was clear that any heaven-bound souls had already been raptured, and we were all the remnants, left to fend for ourselves on the streets, no matter how devout we may feel ourselves to be. Watching this scene, I caught the eye of a homeless man wearing a World War I gas mask, and we both shrugged in a moment of bleak amusement. Meanwhile, the giant billboards continued to play slick and fashionable commercials around us. Models the size of skyscrapers beckoned the now-vanished crowds to a Shangri-La of perfectly tussled hair, designer jeans, and Calyptian promise. While I have read almost every book by J.G. Ballard, nothing prepared me to be standing almost alone in the sudden ruins of an already indecipherable culture. Enigmatic, shimmering gods and goddesses beckoned to me with a kind of sadistic or at least uncomprehending glee. I wanted to stay there for a while, in the belly of this evacuated beast, in order to absorb the full effect of a pantheon now abandoned by man whose solicitous smiles and flirtatious gestures were now mute and unseen. Like an aurora borealis shimmering over the valley of death. Of course, all pronouncements of the end of capitalism are premature. Indeed, I wouldn't be surprised if the forces of capital outlive humanity. Insert overused Frederick Jamison quote here. As long as Instagram is still functioning, along with Wi-Fi, the children of these avatars of consumption will persist, finding new ways to drape their life bodies in the invisible garments of the economic emperor, also known as brands. Nevertheless, the whole world has a real fire festival vibe right now. The virus has infected my dreams, so I'm even afraid to socialize 
onerically. Clicking around online, it seems I'm not the only one. Even in the creative, compensatory theatres of the slumbering unconscious, we are practicing metaphysical distancing just to be safe. What an incalculable loss. Last night, I had a dream where I was wandering through a field hospital at night. Hundreds of beds literally out in a field full of patients struck down by the virus. For some reason, I wasn't scared of being infected, wandering between the beds in the moonlight. I soon noticed that the heart monitors were displaying stock market surges and drops rather than the pulse of the sick ones. One patient started to try to say something to me, short of breath. I leaned closer and heard the old man wheeze. Coming soon to Netflix, the new season of Stranger Things. I looked at the doctor nearby, puzzled. He wearily explained that in order to satisfy the requirements for health coverage, patients had to make regular sponsored announcements up to their last dying breath. I suppose this is obvious, but one reason we all feel so weird right now is because we're scared, and thus our fight-or-flight reflex is activated. And yet we are obliged to stay put, neither fighting nor fleeing. So we marinade in our homemade, homeopathic adrenaline drips. As a result, the 7pm whooping and hollering and support of medical workers hasn't yet failed to make me misty. There's a couple of adorable kids who clamber up on the roof opposite with their young father and bang some pots like gongs. It's a collective tonic after all the isolation and disquiet and quiet, punctuated increasingly frequently by silence. Is it too much to ask a new sense of the people will arise from this? That shameful feeling when you can feel a personal essay coalescing in one's mind like an unwanted ovum, or rather like a hairball that you need to cough up, as if the world needs yet another middle-class person commenting on the coronavirus. And yet, what else are we supposed to do? Highly trained word processors trapped inside with access to little more than keyboards and caffeine. Of course, I'm currently one of the lucky ones, the equivalent of a contestant on The Circle, who is more likely to suffer from cavern fever than anything else, while the desperate ones deliver groceries to my door unseen. Though truth be told, the supply chains in the city have collapsed and I can no longer count on deliveries. The real question is whether C-19, as people are starting to call it, will prompt a Jenga-like collapse, including the billionaires whose vast and unthinkable fortunes cannot withstand the breakdown of the banking system, or will sanity eventually prevail and new safety nets will be installed, including the long overdue win-win scenario of a universal basic income, as currently being considered in Spain. Depressingly, however, the US seems hell-bent on belligerently belly-flopping into its new global role as failed state number one. Indeed, as I write, the White House has just refused to bail out the United States Postal Service. Can it be a coincidence that this is our last chance to communicate with each other, free of corporate surveillance and interference? Twitter, Facebook and so on make us feel more connected to those we've now been decisively estranged from. But they also magnify and amplify this estrangement, clumsily reinforcing the profound gulf between telecommunication and the kind fostered by physical proximity. My point is not to simply insist on the superiority of the latter, but to bemoan the lengths to which our political managers are actively trying to banish it. The Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben has justifiably caught a lot of flack for his commentary on the crisis especially his comments playing down the horrific fatality rate of the virus. In this sense, he is speaking in concert with despicable figures like Bolsonaro and our own Orange Menace. Nevertheless, he is also not exactly off the mark when he foresees the ways in which our current technocratic managers will seize on this opportunity to introduce new draconian surveillance measures and systems, policing our every move and even monitoring the contents of our bloodstreams in real time. Agamben writes, quote, The epidemic has caused to appear with clarity is that the state of exception to which governments have habituated us for some time 
has truly become the normal condition. There have been more serious epidemics in the past, but no one has ever thought for that reason to declare a state of emergency like the current one, which prevents us from even moving. People have been so habituated to live in conditions of perennial crisis and perennial emergency that they don't seem to notice that their life has been reduced to a purely biological condition and is not only every social and political dimension, but also human and affective. A society that lives in a perennial state of emergency cannot be a free society. We in fact live in a society that has sacrificed freedom to so-called reasons of security and has therefore condemned itself to live in a perennial state of fear and insecurity. End quote. Looking out my kitchen window at 9 p.m. on a Friday night, the streets are empty. Normally, a throng of people would be crisscrossing my vision on foot, on bikes, and cars. But now I see only the occasional delivery guy or emergency vehicle. Even the 24-hour bodega on the corner, which has always been my beacon in the dark, my well-lighted place, is closed. But then suddenly, a swarm of people flurry past. A renegade group of cycle punks are taking advantage of the empty roads and going on a nocturnal joyride, complete with skull masks and pirate flags. My heart skips a beat. I know that I should be tut-tutting these youngsters high on adrenaline and Mad Max movies, but the truth is, my spirit flies out to them, with them. Somehow, they are different to the libertarians, brandishing machine guns on the steps of state parliaments demanding that we reopen the economy. These steamless steampunks seem to me more like angels or valkyries of a post-carbon future, even as they risk spreading the infection in their wake. The great god Pan is dead, announced the Egyptian sailor, Thamos. 2,000 years ago. Long live Pan, I whispered to the window, embarrassed at my fey references in a time of real crisis. To be clear, I confess this moment of romantic transport not to question the importance of social distancing at this moment, but to also register the detrimental effects on our spirits, our bodies, and our sense of sensual potential. For while it is to be applauded that great cultural institutions and esteemed archives are putting almost infinite hours of entertainment, distraction, and edification online for free, this won't compensate for the losses of naive gatherings, contact, closeness. People are already noting how they watch a TV show from last year and are appalled at how closely the characters interact. Moreover, we've had access to exponential zettabytes of human output for years now. That's not where the vitality of our existential potential adheres. Truly, we are living, as Jean Baudrillard noted, after the orgy. With the exception of the 1%, presumably, who are still having eyes-wide-shut sex parties on their private islands with Ukrainian escorts who have all been medically pre-screened. My sister, a Buddhist monk, is trying to figure out the technology to enable her to upload some videos on turning self-isolation into self-actualization. This reminds me of the old Zen saying, don't just do something, sit there. Certainly this is a lesson we could all learn at this time, still tyrannized as we are by the compulsion to be productive. Agamben was previously famous for redefining the classical notion of bare life, or zoe, which is an ontological condition preceding all biopolitical codings. In simpler terms, it is a naked form of existence which has not yet been captured, processed, and sorted into the various categories on which society depends – citizen, barbarian, slave, alien, and so on. Refugees are a specter haunting this bureaucratic system because they threaten to overwhelm it. In their fleshy striving to persist, they are a form of bare life that disturbingly reminds all of us that we are all potentially, literally, in the same boat. And if there is one crucial lesson the coronavirus has taught us, is that the whole world is an infectious, claustrophobic cruise ship. All the neoliberal economic policies and structures that enabled just-in-time capitalism are what also set the perfect conditions for this just-in-time apocalypse since there was no contingency planning, no stockpiles, 
no emergency backup resources. There was merely the ongoing plundering of bare lives, barely able to make a living, because the rich are, stupefyingly, somehow not rich enough yet. We all knew this, in our bones, as we watched the planet itself gasping for breath. The Amazon forest, the lungs of the world, have been on fire with the economic equivalent of COVID-19, fanned by the corporate logic of Amazon.com. And yet we wrung our hands impotently, hoping the next generation, or preferably the one after that, would have to deal with the real consequences. First world problems, of course, since most of the world has been dealing with these consequences for years, decades, centuries. Which brings me back to my Russian bear. In some ways, he is one of the lucky ones, since he is alive and healthy, albeit bored and in captivity. Given the ways in which humans have monopolized and decimated the ecological world for our own ends, animal life has been dragged almost completely inside our own biopolitical apparatus. There is no longer any outside the Anthropocene. No beyond the toxins we have created, the plastics we have produced on such a mind-boggling scale. We have, for instance, created a new type of bear life for the life of bears that are obliged to endure their existence inside our own cages or, at best, the perimeters of our own national parks. Instead of catching salmon in living streams, too many of them now frolic in tiny pools on live streams. Perhaps it's ironic, however, that I'm feeling sorry for a bear that enjoys more room to roam than I do. Human delusional pathos forever wins the day. Heidegger notoriously claimed that animals are poor in world. This in comparison to humans, who are, at least on a good day, supposed to be world-building. Nevertheless, I'm grateful to have a lockdown coach like this Russian bear. When he devises a new toy from the sticks and stones that litter his compound, I swear he laughs to himself. And who knows what flights of imagination he goes on while I sit in a Zoom office hour awaiting students that never arrive. Okay. Great. Thanks. I hope that Welcome back, everyone. So we now have some time for questions with Dominic. And to repeat what I said before, please, uh, you know, feel free to open up the Q&A box on Zoom and enter your questions there or raise your hand in the participants part and we'll call on you to ask your question. I'll start with the question from Danielle that I think uh, summarizes what a lot of people are probably thinking, certainly what I'm thinking. Does entertainment provide structure or some sort of routine under quarantine, or is it simply a distraction that clouds our vision against, um, oh man, everything jumps around, against the current problems in the world? So, you know, I think especially in the wake of the past week, we can come to feel like you know, watching Netflix under quarantine is just an evasion of what really matters. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what, what your thoughts are on that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting distinction, kind of um, just distraction versus structure. I think the two go kind of hand in hand in a way. Like, I don't know, I can only really speak from my own consumption habits, but you know, I think tend to watch Netflix or whatever after dinner or, you know, sometimes after lunch. And it's, it's part of the routine. It's definitely a way of punctuating the day and having a diurnal rhythm, which keeps you sane. But um, yeah, there is this sense that sometimes that rhythm becomes so over familiar and the fact that we weren't allowed to 
um, kind of go outside. It, it was very much sort of the world is being brought to you. And so um, your environment suddenly is highly, you know, it, it's basically mediated. Um, you have this uncanny sense that you can access anywhere in the world. You know, I was watching empty streets of Venice and things like that. And yet I was very much still, um, you know, where I was. So I think, I mean, the whole new media landscape is the way it's been built has to be one of the main things we take into account, this sort of engineering of attention and distraction. And it's all very deliberate the way Netflix skips credits and goes straight to the next show to try and make a seamless, you know, TikTok is the perfect example because you just scroll constantly and you don't even have a choice to navigate. Um, so Netflix is a bit old fashioned in that way. It's not just this feed that you surrender to. Um, so I do think it's, it's, it's both, it's a distraction. It also provides structure. Um, and I mean, one, one thing to maybe get on the table right at the beginning of this part is that, you know, I, I've, I've argued before about this idea that we are being hyper modulated. Um, so some philosophers say the danger is that we're being synchronized by these big media. We're all being made to watch the same shows. You know, we all watch Tiger King during, <laughs> during the lockdown. So we, get, we all had this shared reference, which is actually quite, you know, in some ways great because we can share something, at least a water cooler experience. Um, but my argument before about the way the internet works is it's quite clever in that it's like Enron moving energy around the system. Um, when somebody's furious about the fires in the Amazon, someone else is giggling at a cute cat online. And then that suddenly flips, you know, 30 seconds later, I can be suddenly furious and the person who was furious is now giggling at a cat. And so there's no, the way that sort of social steam and aff uh, sort of affective indignation that we all feel coursing through the system, it's a it's a kind of ingenious way of distributing that so it never boils over. Of course, things have changed. Um, so that, that hypermodulation, in a way, I, I, if I'm, I'm maybe I'm being biased, but I think it confirms my suspicion, the fact that we were all in lockdown. I don't think it's a coincidence that this uprising is happening after two months of lockdown. I, I, I really think we were sort of shepherded onto the same page. We all saw the footage of um you know of george floyd and so i think that 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 unfortunate circumstances of synchronicity did lead to a kind of the kind of enron explosion that that um the system usually set up to avoid i think i took that a place you weren't um maybe interested in but that's that's where i went but thanks that's for the great question that's great. So that leads to a follow-up question that I have about, you know, the possible revolutionary potential of a transformed relationship to images that mm -hmm. might come out of this experience where to an unprecedented degree, I think over the past two and a half months, we were living fully in a world of images. And, you know, you suggested that there might be, you know, you invoke Benjamin, and Benjamin certainly thought that with new media and with the new relationship to new media, there was a revolutionary potential. Mm. And I wonder if you see any such potential today. Uh, well, as always, I think there's two sides to any coin and, and the, the potential is obviously, I mean, somebody referred to this as the American spring recently, interesting. <laughs> so the, um, I dread to think how, how the popular feeling would be if we only had access to CNN or the mainstream media outlets. So the, the democratization of the tools of the image making is a huge part of, of, um, of yeah, this more revolutionary um, relationship to it. At the same time, we're also watching the circulation of uncontextualized images. And so, um, there's this kind of uh, profound ontological doubt about, you know, framing and, and, and you know, even if you see uh, a video of brutality, 
you don't know if it's been doctored, if it's been, you know. So, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful that there is evidence of sort of uh, the atrocities that are happening in the streets right now. But it's, it's not like, um, it's just the, the, there's a sort of inflation, <laughs> a vast inflation of the, of the symbolic efficiency of, of images when um, we're sort of awash in it already and we don't know the genre of, um, so it, it becomes, well, it becomes hyper real. I mean, I, I keep having, I mean, my home base is Baudrillard for a long time and I think he did understand the stakes and the mechanics of what happens when we live inside images. It's not that we live in a fake world, it's just, it's that they become more real than real. And that's, that's hence the mediation. So well, this is a perfect opportunity to raise a question that uh, an old friend of mine, David, asked, uh, which is, okay, as these images become more real than real, mm -hmm. what kind of uh, forms of political protest are there with regard to them? And the way he puts this question is, how can we loot an online store? <laughs> uh, yeah, indeed. I mean, it's, it's part of it's a quite, I mean, a big part of it is still about narrative. You know, I think it's still, um, whatever the kind of, I took, I, I referenced the general structure of feeling in the, in the film. I think um, we are simplistic creatures in a way, we, we do need pretty simple narratives. And um, it's, it's amazing to see when one starts to be replaced by another. Um, so I don't know, looting an online store, I guess in terms of hijacking, hijacking the narrative or at least just re reframing it. Um, so it, I think, obviously I'm not a, you know, I'm not a Luddite, I don't think, I don't think we should, uh, you know, just throw away all our technologies because I think hum humans are essentially technological creatures, but I think we need to be very um, mindful about their potential versus their, the dangers that come with their own internal affordances. So two, a, a week, two weeks ago, I would have said that, yes, you could do all sorts of amazing things with your phones, but the fact that we've been captured by them to this extent kind of neutralizes the, the, the political potential. Um, but, you know, um, I'm, I'm excited to say that we're in kind of new liminal territory now and, and it's yet to play out. Um, but I think what we're, we're seeing, it's mostly young people in the streets and they're also very media literate. They understand virality, they understand memes, the mimetic transmission. And so it's a kind of, I mean, it's a propaganda war. Memes are another way of saying propaganda. So I think it's, how do you, how do you fight the signal to noise ratio in an effective way? If I knew that, I would be a leader <laughs> in, uh, you know, I would be one of the main people um, leading the the protests. But um, I, I think that ultimately, uh, yeah, I, I really, I, I don't want to say anything too definitive in, in the moment because it's still such a moment, but I hope those are the kind of coordinates that it makes sense. There's an idea that you, that's in the film that you just echoed about humans as essentially technological build, beings, mm. where I take it that in part, that means it would be a mistake to think of humans and technology as, you know, existing in separate domains and where our natural state is somehow technologically free. Right. Um, and the opposing view that you seem to be endorsing involves yeah, the other, idea that humans by their very nature are world builders. And right. I wonder if we can connect that to yeah, like to the contrast that we've seen in the images of your film mm. versus the images of this past week where now the streets are flooded with people. Yeah, yeah. And so I wonder how do you, what forms do you think world building can take in the current moment? 
Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to. I, I wouldn't want to follow Heidegger to the extent where I think humans are the only world builders. That's why I love this bear because he's building clearly building worlds as well um, as do many other creatures. Uh, but when it comes to our own um, politics, yeah, I think to rebuild a world would be to rebuild its kind of media infrastructure because. That's how we communicate, and how we communicate is who we are. Like, I don't believe we're isolated, even if we are trapped in our own isolated rooms and pods and apartments. What the last few days have shown us is that that is that is not sustainable. We we need to be together, even if it's dangerous. You know, <laughs> it's it's like um, we're willing to risk terrible disease because the stakes are too high if we if we don't. Um, obviously, again, I'm not condoning, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I see the wisdom in social distancing, but even in the film before the uprising, I, um, you know, there were these seeds, like the people banging pots out of the window and the kids on the bikes, there was these uh, seeds of a new, of building a new world. And I think it would be the bones of that or the, the sort of scaffolding of that would be um, shared media, you know, not top-down media. We've seen so many videos of literally scripts going out to every single news outlet and reading exactly the same words. And so um, kind, of, kind of dismantling that system seems essential to me, the kind of the Netflix, Netflix spoon-fed model where we just are uh, kind of lay back and 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 suck on the teat of you know um the ent entertainment industrial military complex <laughs> where even something like space force is a gentle satire is actually you know still part of the same infrastructural problem um so yeah i think part of that is to build a world that does not isolate, that does not try to steal attention, but tries to cultivate it, longer loops, not, you know, the very fact that we have a little red dot in Facebook for it, it's because of lots of neurological engineering. You know, they know how to, to sort of reanimalize us. I guess that was one of the main points of the film is that we are recaptivating ourselves through media. Media has the potential to open us up to the world, to make us more, um, to see being or to co-create being together. I mean, these are powerful tools, but we choose instead the sort of Plato's cave route and cap, sort of self-captivate ourselves and, and, it, and it forecloses on the world. So um, as McLuhan said, you, Every time each new technology extends our senses, it extends our perception and our environments, but at the same time, it, it amputates it, um, it, for, it forecloses it. So there's, it's, it's never a simple operation. There's always, it's as each, it's, uh, you know, each action comes with a reaction. So it's, it's, it's taking all of that into account. But for me, new world building would be something that, um, obviously uh, does not leave the agenda to the 1% and, and allows a plurality of voices. And, um, you know, uh, does not, <laughs> is not sort of built to, to diffuse political anger or feelings or expression. You know, so, so that it's it allows that to happen, and and if that means a lot of white people are going to feel uncomfortable or attacked, then you know maybe that's a process we got to go through to get to the other side. This seems relevant to a question Kati Yoon has uh, about the agency of Netflix that you <laughs> provocatively uh, mentioned in the film. So I'll read her question: Netflix as a sentient being. Can you talk more about that? I think it was a very provocative statement to make. Does the choice demonstrate, uh, demonstrate biomimicry? Is Netflix trying to make us think we have agency? Thanks, Katya. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it is a bit of a provocation, but I do find it completely uncanny that just before lockdown, we had these two shows which were about people essentially being quarantined and um, not even seeing each other's faces. So, um, is Netflix there to give us a sense of agency? I mean, I think it's, <laughs> it just seemed too perfect to me. The seamless, the way that everything is sort of comes to our door, like with our entertainment and edification comes through the, through the internet and food arrives outside. And again, it, it had this zoo, it, it, it's weird to be watching Tiger King when we're all inside our own little cages. And it just, it spoke to me again about the, this, captive, this sort of self-captivation, self-capturing narrative. And so the flip side of that is that if we get so bored, I mean, people famously hate Netflix, right? They, they just, we will flip around looking at possibilities more than maybe even binge actual shows. It's, it's, it's what Natasha Dow Shul calls the machine zone that is the, it's like a narcotic, it's sort of, you know, the, the new opium of the masses. So we, we love being in the, in, we don't even, we kind of resent even being entertained because that takes a little bit of work to figure out plot and everything. So we just skip around possibility of things we might watch and we hang in this limbo like machine zone. And yeah, that's very, um, that's a narcotic. That means we're not, we're not thinking, we're not doing, and that's the perfect way for human subjectivity to be to, for, to, to maximize profits. So my hope is that we reach this sort of saturation point when we're all forced inside to do that. We did reach a saturation point. Again, I don't think it's a coincidence that the explosion happened soon after that because we just realized we weren't just doing that separately and able to distract ourselves from the fact that we were being distracted anymore. It was very clear. This is why despite all the pushback against the Gambin, which I respect and understand, I do think there's a, you know, an irritating grain of truth there that um, we, are, we are kind of being deliberately reduced to our biological <laughs> condition so that we can, they can suck money out of us. So why is Google spending most of its money on self-driving cars? Nobody wants that except Silicon Valley so that they can sell us more ads while we're driving. I mean, why not funnel that money into actual, you know, curing cancer and things like that? So um, I'm very cynical about our media infrastructure and what it's set up to do. And I think it's very effective at what it's doing. And I think Netflix, yeah, if something's going to become sentient, it might be Netflix because it knows what we like. It knows exactly what we, when the moment we get too bored and turn off and it adjusts accordingly. So it does have machine learning humming in the background. And so it's only half a joke to say that Netflix is becoming sentient. I like that. Miranda, uh, do you jump in here? Yeah. Um, thank you, Dominic. This was a really sort of like interesting talk and sort of an, a sort of new medium that we've had in this talk series. Like, um, and I guess I kind of wanted to sort of echo uh, Valerie King's question. Maybe like, so I, 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 I understand, like, it's understandable that we're in this like, yeah, moment of deep historical unprecedented. Um, sometimes we have other historical events with similar uh, structures that can maybe help us understand like the phenomenology that will set in after this. Um, so Valerie is sort of referencing the AIDS crisis and sort of giving an anecdote from one of her friends who said that throughout his childhood he associated sex with death and something that he hasn't recovered from. And I guess I am also interested in her question as to like what are, like what if we kind of take from the AIDS crisis and other epidemics or other social upheavals and then given this new technological um, element of our subjectivation, like what types of phenomenologies of embodiment or sense mm. of selves do you see coming out of this for, she says, like young adults and children? Yeah. Um, wow. All great questions, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a big one, so. Yeah, it, and it's <laughs> one I've been thinking a lot about because, I mean, I have a book coming out very soon, the proofs just arrived actually, um, called Peak Libido, which 
um, is in, uh, influenced by Bernard Stiegler, a French philosopher of technology who argues that we're running out of libido in the same way we're running out of oil, you know. Um, and his, he has quite an idiosyncratic definition of libido, which is you know, a very positive one, that it means to take care, to be sort of in love. It's Freud who did consider eros as the main building block of human culture. And so um, we still have kind of urges, we still have drives, but again, it's this sort of back to the animal through consumption. Um, it's like we leapfrog the human element, which for Stiegler is libido. So, and it's a lot of, um, a lot of that is because it's being tapped by Madison Avenue, by, um, by yeah, social media. And hence my romance about Pan and everything is that there will, on the other side of a pandemic, um, there will be a return to the, mm -hmm. the texture, to materiality, to a genuine interaction. I mean, I really sound like a, like a Luddite now, but I don't see them as, as either or. Like, you know, you could go to the most technologically sophisticated rave with fantastic visuals and the music that could never happen you know, <laughs> with, mm. with mm. loops and stuff. And you're going to have a wonderful Dionysian experience. You know, a lot of my students are very upset about not being able to gather in concerts and things because who you are emerges from the collective. Like we are, we are singular plural creatures. Heidegger even talks about mitzain, the being with that's primal. So, you know, Contemporary culture tries to teach us as monads, as isolated individuals, but um, you know, on almost every level, we're not, and we need, to, and we recognize that, and that's why we, but we recognize that subconsciously, which is why we have all these symptoms of anxiety and depression, because we are just not connecting in kind of organic ways, organic ways that can be amplified and enhanced through technology, but which can't be replaced by technology. So I hope that gives you an inkling of where I'm going. But I do think, yeah, we have to get back to that somehow. Because <laughs> it's there's otherwise two, what's but there's two ways of hearing what you're saying now. One is okay. getting back to something that was yeah. you know a prior way of being with others. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then hinted at in several of your comments is the possibility of arriving at a new way of being with others. Well, again, they're not separable, right? I mean, you we're always bringing nothing new under the sun. I kind of believe that on several levels that, you know, humans are going to human. But um, what's exciting about the moment, I mean, t uh, digital media was trying to abolish the public sphere and also the future. Mark Fisher has this wonderful phrase, the slow cancellation of the future. What's opening up is the new, you know, a temporality of, of um, the beyond, getting beyond just the routine of Netflix and chilling. There's something beyond that, beyond that horizon, what Heidegger would call the open. And, um, but it will involve a lot of stuff we used to do, I hope. I mean, we don't throw out babies with the bathwater. I mean, we all know that the most nourishing uh, kind of epiphany moments we've had are pretty simple. You know, their mm -hmm. meals with friends, their music with talented people, their unexpected encounters. Um, I guess I'm pretty old fashioned in that way. And, and again, I mean, the chance for serendipity online is, is there. And how do you, how do you kind of uh, cash that in? How do you, yeah, it's a terrible capitalist metaphor. But how do you, how do you kind of realize that, actualize that potential of of the serendipity of the online? So this relates to a question Rob has about whether what you're calling quarantine time is simply an exaggerated version mm. of a pre-existing trend. Is it just you know? And uh, you know, souped up version of what we already were experiencing before in our online mediated, you know, lives, or is it giving us something different in kind? And if so, what? Like, how does it transformed our relation to our 
online existence? Right. I think it, because it was such an intensification of what we were experiencing already, I mean, we could be out in the world again before, like let's go back four, four or five months. We could be out on the subway surrounded by humans without masks and still completely absorbed in our phones. So in a way, the quarantine, COVID-19, I think was like an X-ray showing us the extent to which we had already um, abandoned the public sphere and kind of self-isolated into our, into our pods here. And um, so I think even though it's the same, it's an intensification, there is that tipping point, there's that crystallization where it changes, where we become, where we see it truly for what it is. So it did mean that is, you know, the Peggy Lee song, is, is this all, is that all there is? You know, do we really want to entertain ourselves uh, to death when it's not even that entertaining? Like, let's remember the Netflix model is just good enough, just as the neoliberal is just in time. Like Netflix deliberately is not premium content or anything that would truly absorb us. It's like just good enough to keep watching. And <laughs> so I think, um, I do think the lockdown on the one hand, it gave us a lot of time to think. So we became like the Russian bear. We, we, we realized we weren't getting actually any meaningful pushback from the world. You need antagonism, you need, um, you know, you need purchase on it. Um, and so I think it, it did become different in kind by virtue of, it, of its saturation. So that leads me to ask, I'm going to combine two questions from Amelia and Giuseppe to ask a, the final combined question, because it relates to that image of the bear and this transformed relationship we might have to the images that we live inside of now. Mm. So, um, you know, it's, Giuseppe brings up the possibility of escape. What would it be for the bear to escape? What would it be for us? to follow the model of a bear and escaping from this, you know, mm. panopticon like zoo enclosure of being watched at all times. And the twist that Emilio adds to this question is to say, is there a way by consuming this online content to generate agency or knowledge of communities that can contribute in this time of crisis? Uh, I'm thinking of new media and communities, such as gaming communities, that differentiate the ways of consuming and creating content and also engaging with the audience. Right. I guess the most stark way to put this question would be, you nightly see brought out the machine zone of the completely passive mm. activity of just scanning through options on Netflix that ever even committing to watching one, which is could not be more of a evasion of commitment. What's, is there an online alternative or, you know, mm. Contrast to that? I think you think of datafied, datafied Dasein being neither here nor there. Um, right, so while I'm not advocating or believing in a kind of red pill simplified matrix answer where we can just somehow get outside of, of the matrix, as Baudrillard famously said, the, the film The Matrix is the kind of film that The Matrix itself would make about The Matrix. Um, or to even just get out of the cave. Uh, interestingly, the bear this morning, my wife still watches him religiously. Uh, they built him a house and he pulled it down today. He's completely destroyed his own house, which is probably allegorical, but I, I don't know what to go from that. But yes, gaming communities, um, I do think that's the answer. It's not to switch off. It's not to just unplug. Um, obviously, I think we should do that in certain rhythms, you know, that's terrible. But um, the kind of affiliations and inspirations we get from people online is, is the reason it's so sticky, ultimately, the reason we keep coming back, even if we hate Facebook as I do, you know, I kind of get off the damn thing because I love a lot of the people on there and what they teach me. And so how do we transfer that community, that genuine community that I have with people online outside of the, 
you know, this terrible frame of surveillance and manipulation and, and you know, uh, hiding information. So the more that we can build our own networks, build our own platforms, you know, my colleague Trebo Schultz is, keeps arguing uh, that very importantly, we need to create co platform cooperativism. You know, if we own the tools and we can set the protocols, then you know, we're not just selling ourselves. We aren't the product anymore, but we are, are using, using the tools. So, you know, you, you, the, I, I think of how the K-pop community I was just reading this morning how the K-pop community are kind of jamming a lot of the police signals right now, um, a white supremacist communication network. So I, I do believe, I, you know, I, have, I believe there's a strong place for online collectivism and, and um, kind of activism and, and strategic work. Uh, but you know, the fact that all of it is funneled through Twitter, mostly the, and that just leaves a trace of, you know, protest. Even if we see a protest, the viol um, abuse that's happening in a protest, that also allows the authorities to identify people who are at that protest. So it's, there's always just a double-edged sword to these things. So I, I would never advocate sort of, um, you know, uh, decisively one way or the other, but just to be more thoughtful about decisions we make and the architectures we use and um, yeah, try to figure out how to, to wrench the power away from the profit motive, which ultimately overdetermines everything. That's a very uh, true uh, point to end on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but hopefully, you know, I mean, this is, Talk about cautious. I, I hope we're upgrading from cruel optimism to cautious optimism. Okay, good. It's a little bit of optimism there too. Okay, I'd like to thank you, Dominic, so much. This was wonderful. Uh, we really appreciate it. And yeah, thanks all for your questions and for sitting through a half an hour. Yeah. Sure. Well, was, <laughs> Media was, frame. Very worth it. Thank you, everybody else, for joining us. I've just posted the talk uh, series website online and keep an eye out for the additional uh, meeting we're trying to schedule. So thank you, Dominic. Thank you everybody for joining us. Hope to see you all soon. Yeah, thanks all. Thanks, Dominic. Thanks so much.